would shake it. It's Jeff and Anwar. K and A, I guess, is what I should say. Catching Anwar here on the Orange Blows Texas Football Channel. Do us a solid like the video, subscribe to the channel, get notifications for all of the badass content that we're trying to put out there for you on a daily basis. Today, in this video, we're talking specifically about some comments that Steve Sarkeesian made at a speaking event last night, Monday night, in San Antonio, centering on the defensive side of the ball that were so curious in the eyes and mind of Anwar Richardson that he was like, catch, you got to do a video about this. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, catch, you know, it's interesting that, you know, when we start talking about the defense and the areas that they struggled in last year, and then we started, and we saw the addition of Gary Patterson to the staff, we started wondering what will be Gary Patterson's impact? Like what, what will he be doing and how much impact, how much input will he be able to have? And, you know, will he be a figurehead? Will he be a guy that Steve Sarkeesian leans on? And I thought last night on Monday when I was in San Antonio at a Texas Texas uh, event uh, at the rustic, nice place, by the way, um, he, he gave us a glimpse of something kind of like a philosophical change catch that I found very interesting. He talked about catch that, they were going to go away from going more of a zone defense like they played last year. He felt like, catch he said, he talked about, you know, it, it, this didn't really seem to work when he started trying to defend these receivers. And so he wanted to do something a little bit better, a little bit, a little bit different. And so he started talking about they want to be able to play more man coverage this upcoming season. So you started talking about catch some of the, the, the changes that they made, you know, with the Anthony Cooks back there at safety, Keaton Crawford back there at safety, putting Jade Barron at the nickel position. He said so they can play more man defense and be able to tack up front. What's interesting to me about uh, that catch, that's actually a Gary Patterson philosophy. That's what Gary Patterson really implemented there at TCU was really successful for, you know, all those years is being able to attack from the back end, you know, and having back end success, you can have front end success. And so it was to me like kind of the first glimpse where I was like, oh, okay, this is what we're seeing from Gary Patterson. This is what he's kind of bringing it, you know, to the table. I thought it was really interesting one, the admission that they needed to do something different, but then me not having the knowledge of what Gary Patterson did, uh, I, I thought it was really, really uh, intriguing. It's got to be an uncomfortable thing for Pete Kwiatkowski to be in a situation where two years ago he was regarded as one of the best college football defensive coordinators on the planet and a guy that if you could get into your program, what a massive win that would be. One year at Texas, devastating results, and now – now you're not really doing you anymore. You're doing what somebody else wants to do. And, you know, it does make me wonder about the long-term future of this position. Like, you know, when Kwiatkowski's deal expires, is this even what he wants to do? Like, it, it, it feels like I can hear myself saying it, and it feels very first take in the sense of there's no controversy really at this point. So I'm not trying to create controversy, but I'm also not trying to be naive either, right? Like your head coach comes out and says, what we did a year ago didn't work. So now we're changing the thing that we did a year ago. And it's not necessarily the thing that you do. It's not your defense. You know, I mean, there are signs everywhere right now. And I think one of them screams that Gary Patterson is really important inside the scope of this program. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like it's Gary Patterson's kind of a legend and it was a big deal when Texas was able to add him in a position off the field that I think really bolstered the program. Well, if you're going to have Gary Patterson in the program, you want to get the most out of him. So they are, they're getting, I think a stylistic preference that he prefers that, you know, he's more comfortable with kind of goes in the, flies in the face of what your defensive coordinator does. It is interesting. It's interesting because if we saw this happening anywhere else, we wouldn't be afraid to talk about what some of these implications would seem to indicate. But because it's our beat, you're like, oh, well, I don't want to cause any trouble and like mm -hmm. print fire in a crowded theater. But like, yeah, Gary Patterson's really important right now. Yeah, catch, you know, we've seen it happen. I would almost say with, you know, three straight coaches. I think people have come in here 
and underestimated the Big 12. I think people have come in here and thought to themselves, it's arena football. This will be easy. I'm going to bring what I've done previously, and then I'll be fine. And we saw Charlie come in there thinking to himself, you know, I know what it was like. I I was in the SEC for all these years. I've been able to see these kind of offenses before. I'll be able to handle it. And that defense struggle, <laughs> right? I'm sorry. I just <laughs> just saying the just listening to you say the words just made me uncontrollably laugh. I'm sorry. Go it's ahead. okay. It's all right. We saw we saw we saw Tom come in, and I think he thought to himself, you know, okay, I'm, I'm at Houston. I've seen this kind of stuff before. I, I, I've got a good handle of this. Tom but he beat Big Twelve teams yeah. in, at Houston, so for yeah. good reason, I would think he would be overconfident, or at least supremely confident yeah and then and, you know and, and after a couple of years into Todd Orlando's tenure Tom was like okay we gotta we gotta I gotta bring in Chris Ash right you remember you remember the infamous Chris Ash is just gonna be a consultant and he's just here to kind of give a one over look <laughs> yes. we're like that don't sound right that well, don't, hey, hey and all our, what did we say at the time we were like that's a that's that's ominous it, it almost makes you think that if there's a coordinator change that'll take place that he's like ready made to be that guy. It's not too dissimilar from what we're talking about now. Correct. And there was denied, denied, no, no, no. And then it's like Chris Ash, the new defense coordinator, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I think we saw, and then we saw, so we see Steve Sarkeesian come in with Pete K and thinking to themselves, had success out there in Washington, this and that. And again, we uh, once again, I think people sleep on the Big 12 catch. I think they think, this is going to be easy. This is going to be light work because you play them one time and you think that's easy. And then they come to find out that, no, it's really not that easy. It looks, sounds easy on paper. I think the great advantage of having a guy like Gary Patterson is that he understands the Big 12. He understands this is the what it takes to have success in the Big 12. And for the, the majority of the time, that Gary Patterson was at TCU. He was highly successful. Highly successful, not only in the Big 12, but against Texas. Yeah. So he understands what it takes. And then I think it's easy, it's easier for them to listen, for him to come in and say, listen, guys, I, I know you've got these thoughts and I know you got these beliefs. Let me tell you why this works and why this doesn't work. And and I, I think if, if, you know, I'll give Steve Sarkeesian credit in, in this this vein for being able to understand that he needs a guy like Gary Patterson and understand that you need to like, listen. Um, I think the results were, you know, it could, he could, he could have, you know, he could have dug his toes in and said, no, no, no. I think Charlie did that. I, I, would you agree? I think Charlie was doing that with Vance for the longest time until finally at the end, Charlie mid season demotes Vance Bedford. And it's like, all right, I, I've got it. I've got to try to do something. You know, I think Charlie was in now for a long time. But at least give Steve Sarkeesian credit for at least in year one saying, oh, I, I better do something different. I better do something fast. And I think that's where Gary Patterson really helps. I mean, Gary Patterson's a huge personality. Mm-hmm. For, rightfully so. He's one of the most successful coaches from the state of Texas of like his coaching generation. Right. I mean, you can take the last 30 years or so and the success that he's had where he had it, how he's had it, the duration of time that he had it. Um, you know, it, it would be surprising if you found out he was a meek personality who, you know, <laughs> was really just the, the the puppet behind the scenes and that there was somebody with a, no, he's a big personality. And Sark, as likable as he is in the minds of most people, he's he's a big personality. When Steve Sarkeesian walks into a room, you know that Steve Sarkeesian is in the room. And and I think Sark wants you to think that he's a big deal. And so those two guys working together doesn't have to work. That it is, I think you said, I think it is a, because, you know, Patterson's probably not here if Chris Del Conte doesn't exist in the, in the job that he's in. There were some really some friendships, both, you know, not just Del Conte, there are bigger friendships that Patterson has among people who work at the University of Texas that working at Texas is cool for him. Like he's, I think, enjoying like who he gets to be around, where he lives, 
all of those types of things. Uh, but there's a world out there where it can't, it doesn't happen because all of the things don't quite fall into place as neatly as they seem to in this situation. But it doesn't work if Sark doesn't feel comfortable inside his own skin. And, you know, like Sark's worked at places with personalities before. I mean, in working at Alabama, he's seen Nick Saban take guys with success, put them into roles, and allow them to help build the, the, the monster into a bigger monster. You know, I think you can see what he's trying to do. It's much easier said than done. However, it does feel like the defense is slightly being set up as if there are any problems this year, it might be with this thing that was a problem a year ago. And so we've made all of these changes. You know, it does, I think, put Pete Kwiatkowski on point that it has to be better this year. The expectations are that they made changes so that it would be better. I don't think there's any more mulligans on the defensive side of the ball going into year three if this defense doesn't take, I think, big steps forward. And I, look, I think if, if Sarkeesian would allow, you know, his assistants to talk, we and, and, and Quiet Kelsey spoke to the media, I think he'd probably say that. Like, look, man, I'm in a results business. We didn't get them a year ago. What do I think about my job security in a world where the results don't get better? Like, just say the words out loud and they kind of speak for themselves. It will be one of the stories and, and, and clouds to keep an eye on is how well the defense plays. How soon does it start to potentially play better? And how much chatter is there about Gary Patterson if the Texas defense uh, doesn't take these – this new philosophy of football that they've tweaked in the off season for better results. You know, it's, there's a lot to unpack there and it will be something that's just impossible to get away, get away from. And it does make you wonder if the defense is really, really good on war. Is Patterson going to get credit for that? What does that mean? Well, he deserve, I mean, look, if the defense is good, he deserves it, right? I mean, is he's having he would have an you know an, an impact on there, and so it can't be it can't be ignored. Because here's the thing in the in the conversation catch of Gary Patterson, we're not talking about a guy who has coached a couple of years at a small program and finally got a chance to be like this analyst here at Texas. How about Gary freaking Patterson, right? I mean, one of the more more successful coaches. He's got a statue. In, of himself at TCU I, catch I don't know you know I've only lived in Texas eight years um he's one of the the bigger coaches in, in state history would you say I don't, I don't know how you quantify that but when you put on your you know your Dara Royals of the world and and you know Mac Browns of the world like Gary's got to be somewhere in your if there's a Mount Rushmore I mean, he's got to be on there, correct? If we're talking about football from the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. So DKR is on the list. Mac Brown's on the list. I'm probably putting Jackie Sherrill on the list from Texas A&M. But that comes with <laughs> a ton of problematic features. You know, like mm -hmm. he did get them on a ton of probation. Um and then we're probably at the Gary Patterson stage. I mean, Texas A&M hasn't had a Gary Patterson since Jackie Sherrill. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't really ever thought about it before, but if you're doing a Mount Rushmore, the only other guy that I can really think of would be a guy like either A. Art Bryles, who I don't think has done it as long and didn't quite deal with the complete set of circumstances. I mean, when Patterson took over at TCU, they weren't even in the Big 12. And, like, they only got into the Big 12 because Patterson did such a kick-ass job that the TCU program became viable as something that people would want to have in a conference. Yeah. And so he's done some things that other people haven't. You maybe think of a guy like Grant Taff. Never did – never never even came close to really accomplishing, I think, what Gary Patterson has done in the modern era. So, yeah, like – it, well, if you can go back to say 1970, so the last 52 years of football being played, 
I don't think you can have a Mount Rushmore of college football coaches from the state of Texas that doesn't include Gary Patterson. So, yeah, so so to that point, then when we start talking about do, do you get credit, would you get credit? Yeah, a guy on the Mount Rushmore would definitely yeah. deserve credit. It's good to know? be that guy. <laughs> yeah, it is good to be that guy. And, like, can I, can I just – the last thing I'll say, I'll say on, uh, on Gary, and, and this would be my, my, my final thought, but I, I, my final thought is kind of tossing it to you. Um, you know, one of the things I've always been impressed about with Gary and, uh, and what he's been able to do is just – and I would like for you to speak on it just a little bit because it's a little bit of your wheelhouse. I've always been impressed in, from the recruiting ranking standpoint, the success that he's been able, he was able to have at TCU. And I just want to get yours. And I know you'll you'll get into the difference between like a three star and a four star, and maybe the, the degrees of difficulty and all those other type of things where it's maybe not that uh, huge of a gap. But I still walk away thinking like, Gary Patterson and Mike Gundy have been two of the best coaches that I've seen that have been able to take the talent that they've had and, and really have success uh, pretty much, you know, it's consistent success. I, Mike Gundy, um, I mean, he's gone to, what, 16, 17 straight bowl games, something crazy uh, like that. Uh, but Patterson also has had a lot of success. Can you just speak to that whole recruiting thing? Because I think you can break it down a little bit better than I can. Well, and I've talked about this on the channel before. So those that follow us religiously, you know, like our homeboy yesterday who was watching from the funeral, uh, <laughs> they will have heard this probably before. But I, there's no one else among, co among coaches in the last 20 years or so that I give the amount of respect that I give to Gary Patterson with regards to Finding football players, just finding talent. This is a guy that likes to look under every rock and find something that he sees that nobody else sees. So he's really from, you know, and, and, and consequently in my business, right, and, and putting together rankings. And it's funny because I did not do this this time. Hmm. Every year that Gary Patterson was a head coach, one of the things, the last things that I would do before I would be ready to publish my rankings, I would do a search on who TCU had offered in football just to be sure there wasn't somebody that I missed that I shouldn't miss. And every year, there'd be some Gary Patterson offers where I'd watch some film and go, holy shit, <laughs> this guy's <laughs> really good. Not Gary Patterson. The guy that I'm watching on film yeah. is really good. Uh... And you know, he's got offers from TCU and McNeese State and Stephen F. Austin. And you're like, how did how did they find this guy? He's it's part of what he does really well. And then the other thing that I, he's, he's done historically well is develop two and three stars like they're four stars. So he has had success taking players lower rated and having them get to NFL levels at players that are rated above them. So he's a great developer of talent. And, you know, he finds needles in a haystack and sometimes projects them at positions nobody else's. Jerry Hughes, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, they've had so many guys over the years, was a high school running back mm -hmm. and turns into an All America defensive end that becomes a first round draft pick. Nobody else was seeing that he saw it he saw it when nobody else did recruits the guy develops the guy and then the guy turns into a monster you want to talk about where a guy deserves credit it's like a one-stop shop of how did that happen for me it falls on one guy and it's why one of the reasons why i would let if i patterson worked for me I want Patterson scouting, evaluating. And if he's a coach on your staff, I want him developing. But I just couldn't have a bigger amount of respect for what he has done historically from an evaluation standpoint. He's the best in the business. The only other guy that I've ever done that with in the industry, ever, in terms of kids from the state of Texas, was Joe Tiller at Purdue back in the day. They picked up Drew Brees, obviously. Everybody remembers that. But, mm -hmm. you know, they were the first to offer Michael Huff. And mm -hmm. it was like every time they offered somebody, they were like EF Hutton, 
you listen. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Gary Patterson, the same thing. There's nobody left in college football in the state of Texas that I quite think that about as long as Gary Patterson is just an off the field guy and not a coach making these decisions. Look, uh, for myself and Anwar Richardson, we appreciate you taking the time to sit through all of that, especially that little Gary Patterson slobber fest that I just <laughs> took in. I was like, just, that just say we threw roses at him. Right? Just, he's like, he's like Eddie Murphy and coming to America. It was like, Greatest evaluator of all time. I mean, <laughs> let me give you a bath, Gary Patterson. No, uh, you, you put me, you put a ball on a tee for me, and you know sometimes I'll hit those hard. Uh, for myself and Anwar Richardson, we would love it if you would subscribe to the channel, get the notifications, uh, like this video. All those things help us in their own weird little analytical YouTube way. There's uh, algorithms that we can't explain but we know they matter. So do all of those things for us if you like us even a little uh, until tomorrow and Thursday when we have the modcast. And quite frankly, every day of the week, we're trying to churn out content here on the Orange Bloods Texas Football Channel. We'll see you then. Later.